invite you to take your Bibles once more and turn in the Old Testament to Deuteronomy chapter 2. We'll pick up with verse 31 this morning and carry on to chapter 3 and verse 22. We trust as those who believe in the providence of God that there are no accidents in this life. There are no circumstances that are outside of God's control. And as I've had opportunity this week just in reflecting upon how to preach this morning, I was convinced that in God's good providence, what we need most is to be reminded that this world is not our home. That we are longing for a new creation. And we see that this morning as we will in Deuteronomy 2, verses 31 and following. I remind you, as we do each week, that this is God's Word. So let's give our attention to its reading. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have begun to give Sion and his land over to you. Begin to take possession, that you may occupy his land. Then Sion came out against us, he and all his people, to battle at Jehaz. And the Lord our God gave him over to us, and we defeated him and his sons and all his people. And we captured all his cities at that time and devoted to destruction every city, men, women, and children. We left no survivors. Only the livestock we took as spoil for ourselves with the plunder of the cities that we captured. From Eroer, which is on the edge of the valley of the Arnon, and from the city that is in the valley as far as Gilead, there was not a city too high for us. The Lord our God gave all into our hands. Only to the land of the sons of Ammon did you did not draw near. That is, to all the banks of the river Jabbok, and the cities of the hill country, whatever the Lord our God had forbidden us. And we turned and went up the way to Bashan. And Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us, he and all his people, to battle at Edre. But the Lord said to me, do not fear him, for I have given him and all his people and his land into your hand, and you shall do to him as you did to Sion, the king of the Amorites, who lived at Heshbon. For the Lord our God gave into our hand Og also, the king of Bashan, and all his people, and we struck him down until he had no survivor left. And we took all his cities at that time. There was not a city that we did not take from them, sixty cities, the whole region of Argon the kingdom of Og in Bashan. All these were cities fortified with high walls, gates and bars, besides very many unwalled villages. And we devoted them to destruction, as we did to Sion, the king of Heshbon, devoting to destruction every city, men, women, and children. But all the livestock and the spoil of the cities we took as our plunder. So we took the land at that time out of the hand of the two kings of the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan from the valley of the Arnon to Mount Hermon. The Sidonians call Hermon Sirion, which, while the Amorites call it Sinir. All the cities of the Tableland and all Gilead and all Bashan, as far as Selica and Andre, cities of the kingdom of Og in Bashan. For only Og, the king of Bashan, was left of the remnant of the Rephaim. Behold, his bed was a bed of iron. Is it not in Rabah of the, Am of the Ammonites? Nine cubits was its length, and four cubits its breadth, according to the common cubit. When we took possession of this land, at that time I gave to the Reubenites and the Gadites the territory beginning in Eroer, which is on the edge of the valley of the Arnon, and half the hill country of Gilead with its cities. The rest of Gilead and all Bashan, the king of Og, that is, all the region of Argob, I gave to the half-tribe of Manasseh. All that portion of Bashan is called the land of Rephaim. Jair, the Manasseh, took all the region of Argob, that is, Bashan, as far as the border of the Geshurites and the Maacathites, and called the villages after his own name, Habath Jair, as it is to this day. To Makir I gave Gilead, and to the Reubenites and the Gadites I gave the territory from Gilead as far as the valley of the Arnon, with the middle of the valley as a border, as far over as the river Jabbok, the border of the Ammonites. The Arabah also, with the Jordan, as the border from Chinnereth, as far as the Sea of the Arabah, the Salt Sea, 
under the slopes of Pisgah on the east. And I commanded you at that time, saying, The Lord your God has given you this land to possess. All your men of valor shall cross over armed before your brothers, the people of Israel. Only your wives, your little ones, and your livestock, I know that you have much livestock, shall remain in the cities that I have given you until the Lord gives rest to your brothers as to you. And they also occupy the land that the Lord your God gives them beyond the Jordan. Then each of you may return to his possession, which I have given you. And I commanded Joshua at that time, Your eyes have seen all that the Lord your God has done to these two kings. So will the Lord do to all the kingdoms into which you are crossing. You shall not fear them, for it is the Lord your God who fights for you. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, we continue our study this morning looking together at Deuteronomy chapter 2. We pick up in verse 31. Here we see Moses speaking to the Israelites, preparing them to enter into the promised land, preparing that this new generation under Joshua might go in and take the land. Remember, this is the second generation that giving of the law, that second giving of the law that we read of here in Deuteronomy, and that we'll come to in time in Deuteronomy chapter 5, that informs God's people how they are expected to live, how they are expected to walk before the Lord, how they are expected to go in and to take the land. And last week we looked at God's presence with His people. Moses focuses our attention on God's presence with his people as they come through the wilderness and as, as they prepare to go into the promised land. Because if God is not with them, then, then nothing will, 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 will turn out for their good. But if God is with them, then whatever it is they may face, they can know that it will turn out for their good. We looked last week at the verses that spoke of God's presence for good, God's presence for judgment, and ultimately God's presence for victory. We were reminded of the truth. And Jesus says that He is with us always, even to the end of the age. And as we have been studying Deuteronomy together, beloved, remember that we, we, we stand on, on the edge, just as the Israelites stood on the edge, ready to move into the promised land, out of the wilderness, that we too stand on the edge, waiting for our great Joshua to come and to bring us into the promised land. This is our hope, and this is what we're reminded of as we study Deuteronomy together. So we talked about Christ and His presence with His church. As one commentator puts it, this is the great secret of his continuance and security, that is, of the believers and of the church's continuance and security. It lives on and cannot die because Jesus Christ is in the midst of it. It is the ship tossed with storm and tempest, but it cannot sink because Christ is on board. Its members may be persecuted, oppressed, imprisoned, robbed, beaten, beheaded, or burned, but his true church is never extinguished lives on through fire and water. As we come to our text this morning, we're still in that history, that, that, that period of history. In other words, we're still coming up to the moment when Israel is there uh, uh, with Moses at the edge of the promised land, ready to go in and to take possession of it. And as we continue to work through the history, Moses is bringing us up to speed, if you will. He's bringing us to that very moment. And in the midst of this historical discussion, he gives instructions about the various peoples. And last week we looked at the, the three people that they were not to attack. If you remember, it was Edom, it was the Moabites, as well as the Ammonites. They were of close relation to Israel, and so they were not to be a target of attack. They were not to lose their land to the Israelites. And right here we begin to get a sense <laughs> That what's happening in Deuteronomy, and indeed what's happening in the Old Testament, is very different than the kind of nation building that we might tend to think of. And that's going to be a very important distinction to make. Israel is being told where they are to move in, how they are to do it. This is not their idea. God is sending them in. As I said, this is an important distinction to make. Because this morning we come to what is perhaps one of the most difficult 
topics in all of the Bible. The topic of holy war. Now this isn't a topic that we're going to be done with in one week. It comes up several times throughout the book of Deuteronomy. And so we will be able to revisit it. But we want to lay the foundation this morning to understand it properly. And this is important because there are two errors, at least two errors, that tend to come up. There are those that on the one side will condemn God's actions. They will say, look at what happens in the Old Testament. Men, women, and children. Clearly that is not a God that we can trust. Clearly that is not a God that we should follow. Oh, the God of the New Testament. He's all love. For God so loved the world. But if you misunderstand holy war, if you misunderstand the sin that was in the land and the judgment that was to be brought, then you will misunderstand the cross. For the cross is about holy war. God is bringing judgment upon sin in His Son. Your sin. My sin. And so if we try to dismiss this or sidestep this issue of holy war, then we're going to misunderstand what the Bible is about and what the, what, what the story of Scripture is. And ultimately our great hope, because one day our great Joshua will return and he will bring judgment, full and final. But there's another error. There's the error that takes the words of the Old Testament and tries to apply them to any nation that is around today. That tries to say that just as Israel marched into the promised land, so a particular nation crosses the sea and marches into a new land and takes it. And anybody in the way becomes their enemies. Worthy of slaughter. That's a misreading of the text as well. So on the one hand, we don't want to sidestep it and try to, to, to help God out, so to speak. But on the other hand, we want to be careful that we don't make a category mistake and apply it to, to earthly nations in our day or in our history. What is going on here is unique. It's very particular to the Old Testament saints. But that means that it's actually going to have great application for us. Because in the New Testament, it's not a nation, it's a church. In the Old Testament, it was a church too, but it was confined, it was confined to a nation. But in the New Testament, it's a church. And that holy war, as we'll see, continues to wage. But the good news is, that in the midst of it, in the midst of battle, our Savior will win. Because he has defeated Satan, death, and hell on the cross. Well, that's a, a, quite a bit of introduction. Let's go into our text and understand what happens in this text. I'm still getting used to preaching narratives again. I've reminded you in the past that preaching a narrative is very different than preaching a prophetic book or preaching especially an epistle or a gospel where you have a tendency to go sort of pericope by pericope. We have long stretches of reading. And it's not as though we sort of exegete word by word when we're looking at narratives. The idea is to understand the story and to be drawn into the story to see how the story leads us to Christ. At least that's how I have approached the narratives that I've preached in the past, and I intend to continue doing that here. So we see first with the language of taking possession. In this taking of possession, we see three things. First, the time for possession has come. Look with me there in verse 31. Behold, I have begun to give Sion and his land over to you. Begin to take possession Moses is reminding the people of Israel that what had happened is they came to that moment where they were at, right there at the border, that everything that led up to that, it was actually a beginning of the promise being fulfilled. That though they were waiting for the glorious inheritance on the other side of the Jordan, the land that flowed with milk and honey, the land that was good and glorious, the truth was that they had already begun to take possession. They had already begun to see the promises of God fulfilled. They saw this in, in, in the, um, when they overtook Sion as well as Og, the king of Bashan. will come to them in time. But, but, but just if you want to look at this elsewhere, it, it goes in more detail in Numbers chapter 21. But here we see that Sion and Og would become an early witness of God's good providence to his people. To remind them of his presence as well as to show them his favor. To show them that they should not fear the great kings 
Remember that as they come into the promised land, they still have that memory, if not directly because they were alive. Some were alive, but most weren't. But it had at least been told to them of that memory of going into the land, of seeing those giant people, and of turning away and not trusting the Lord. And so here they are brought, and as a matter of fact, these skirmishes and these battles that take place right on the border before they go into the promised land is to remind them of God's goodness and His faithfulness. He gives them this land. Now this is going to be a theme that is repeated throughout the Old Testament you see, this is why it's a category mistake to apply this to any other nation. Because, because this Israel was a special nation set apart by God. They are the ones that went to Sinai. They are the ones who made a covenant with the Lord. It was, it was blood that was spilled and it was a special covenant that they were to walk in. No other nation can say that. And that's why everything that they have, it is what is given to them by the Lord. Again, verse thir- in verse 33, the Lord our God gave him over to us. Moses wants to make clear, and this is an important point, that it is not Israel's might or their cleverness or their leaders, but simply the favor of the Lord. That will be their success. They, they, they need to learn what it is that we need to learn. And it is not by might nor by power, but by God's Spirit, says the Lord. Of hosts. Zechariah 4 in verse 6. It was time for possession. And the way that they were to possess was a good land. A good land. A land to be desired. A land that would support them and their offspring. It would provide them with what they needed. It was in every sense of the word an inheritance, a provision. Just some points under these verses. Look with me there. And we're going to be moving around through the text a little bit. But if you look in chapter 3 and verse 4, we, we learn that it was a strategic land. It, it speaks of having 60 cities. Now think about that. Israel had wandered in the wilderness for these 40 years. They had come through the, through the wilderness, living off the land. Literally the manna that, would, that would, they would find when they wake up in the morning. The water from the rock. Pitching a tent. For the tabernacle and along with all of their own abodes, living in, in tents and dwelling there, if you will, as nomads in the wilderness. But here they go in and they receive fortified cities. Fortified cities. And that is, it was strategic because these were cities that had, that had protection already. Moreover, it wasn't just a good land. It wasn't just a fortified what is it just for or strategic land, but it was a defined land. Look at verse 37. There Moses makes clear only to the land of the sons of Ammon did you not draw near. And again, this is, this is a reminder to help us to see that we don't make the category mistake with Israel, assuming that God commands the armies of just any nation, or that any nation can claim God. That would be an error and indeed one that has been committed by various peoples and armies throughout history. If we remove Israel from their redemptive historical context and forget that they are ultimately pointing us to Christ, who secures for us a good land of the new creation, and we, we will be prone to error as well. And so this defined land, they were to take certain portions, but not other portions, to remind them that they were to rely upon the Lord he is the one who would give to them what they needed. He is the one who would open the door. He is also the one who would shut the door. Thinking more broadly about the context of the story here, one of the reasons why we, we know that, this, that the, the land is pointing to something more is because the land could be lost. And indeed, the land would be lost. Just as the Lord gave them the land, so the Lord would one day remove them from the land. Again, we see this reminder here under our first point. Look with me in chapter 2 and verse 32. Then Sion came out against us. He and all his people prepare to battle at Jahaz. And the Lord our God gave him over to us. And we defeated him. Again in verse 2 of chapter, of chapter 3. So the Lord our God gave into our hand Og also, the king of Bashan, and all his people. And we struck him down until he had no survivor. <laughs> 
God is the one who gave them over. Again, it was not Israel's might. How could it be Israel's might? We're going to see this in Deuteronomy 7 where God says, It wasn't because you were the greatest in number or the most powerful that I chose you. In fact, you were the fewest and you were the weakest. No, oh, just as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, one of the reasons why God saves us when we can't save ourselves is so that He receives the glory for our salvation. Israel could not say as they went into the land that it was a land that they had conquered, that they had, had won for themselves. It was not a land that they themselves had earned, but rather a gift that the Lord had given to them. And with that gift comes this uncomfortable question of holy war. Now, it is true, of course, that war is terrible. It is, of course, true, as some in our midst who have experienced, war opens up all kinds of opportunity for atrocity. But that's not what's going on here. And we want to be very careful our God is good, and what He commands is good and right. And so how do we handle that reality with what we see in our text this morning? And this brings us to our second point. Look with me in chapter 2 and verse 34. It says, And we captured all His cities at that time and devoted to destruction every city, men, women, and children. We left no survivors. And again, in chapter 3 and verse 6, we devoted them to destruction, as we did to Sion, the king of Heshbon, devoting to destruction every city, men, women, and children. As I said, this will not be our only time considering this question or this issue. But it is our first time in Deuteronomy, and so we do well to pause and to consider it. The word that is used here for devoting to destruction is an important word. It's a word that's derived from the Hebrew word haram, which means to exterminate. And it refers to a condition in which persons and things become the personal possession of the Lord by virtue of His sovereignty. You see, what happens here in the promised land, what happens with, uh, with, with the people who are outside of the promised land as Israel's coming in and God is commanding them, it is not about Israel, it is about the Lord. Their being devoted to destruction was not about Israel's holiness, but about God's holiness. As Matthew Henry points out, they died not as Israel's enemies, but as sacrifices to divine justice. In the offering of which sacrifices, Israel was employed as a kingdom of priests. And for this, again, we need to step out and we need to remember the, the bigger story. Remember in Genesis 15 when God had promised Abram that his descendants were going to go into the land. Specifically says that they were going to wait for 430 years. And it said, because the sins of the Amorites is not yet complete. See, what Israel is doing here, going to the promised land, they are bringing God's judgment they are bringing God's judgment as God's son, because Israel, Exodus 4, is called the son of God. And they are bringing God's judgment upon wicked sinners. How do we know that these are wicked sinners? Well, Scripture makes clear that the Amorites were full of sin and that they deserved judgment. As a matter of fact, the term that's used here, I shouldn't say the term, but the name that's used here in chapter 3 and verse 11, we're reminded of the Rephaim. Rephaim, or again, in a broader context. We learn of them first in Genesis 14. We read about the Rephaim, the Zumzim, uh, the Zuzim and the Emim, the people who were defeated in battle by Abram. We learn further that these are descendants of the, whole, of the unholy unions that are mentioned in Genesis 6 and verses 1 to 4 between the sons of God and the daughters of men that lead ultimately to the Nephilim, and the flood judgment of all creation. Now there's a lot of questions that go into Genesis 6. And I'm not invoking that to distract us in any way. This is where the Rephaim come from originally. But I want to point out that these were then ungodly kings. Who were known for their wickedness. That's the reason for the flood. For the judgment upon the earth. Was because of the wickedness of the descendants of the Rephaim. And this is, of course, in part the reason for Israel's fear in confronting them 
in the land. And in fact, the whole reason that Moses had reminded them about how Moab and Ammon in our text last week had been successful in taking the land was to encourage them in trusting God even over the Rephaim. The wickedness of the Rephaim will lead to the title being given to the dead spirits who are judged by God in Isaiah chapter 26. They're referred to as shades. All of this is a reminder then of their place in this story and what is going on. Holy war against the enemies of God who rebel against him. And we put it in that context. It's not about Israel somehow being holy and righteous and good, but rather it puts it in the context of the story of Scripture. Because holy war is what the story of the Bible is about ever since sin entered the world. In Genesis 3 and verse 15, God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And the reality, beloved, is that we can follow that seed. We can follow the seed of the serpent through the line of Cain and the seed of the, uh, of, uh, of the, of the, of the woman through the line of Seth. And we can bring them and understand how they fit in here. For Israel is of the seed of the woman. It ultimately will lead to Christ. The Rephaim are the seed of the serpent. You see, this holy war that's going on is God's judgment upon an unholy people. And this helps us to see how Christ fits into this story. You see, these passages about holy war are often used to say that there's a difference between the Old Testament God and the New Testament God. Or at least in his mission. But that is not true. For Jesus comes to defeat the enemies of God. This is why he comes from heaven to earth. To wage war. And to take captives. This is everything that we believe about our Savior. Who comes. And who even takes us captive. Bringing us into his kingdom. Again, this is, this is all throughout the New Testament. But I was thinking this week as I was reflecting upon this text in Deuteronomy of Matthew chapter 12. <clears throat> Jesus says there, beginning in verse 25, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But... If it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then, indeed, he may plunder his house. You see, this holy war in the Old Testament that brings the judgment against the wicked, you see that the the Israel, they take plunder. And this this is the very same story that Jesus is part of. He comes and he wages holy war against the enemies of God. And he takes plunder. He takes spoil. This is the language that we find in Ephesians chapter 4. We're looking back at our text and we see them taking plunder. They're taking the spoil for the cities. Again, this served the purpose of God providing for their needs. Reminding us that God is preparing for us a land that will provide for our every need. And indeed, it reminds us that we are those who are redeemed from Satan's kingdom. We are those who are plundered. Jesus came to bind the strong man, beloved, so that he could plunder his house. And what else is his house in this wicked world? What else is the plunder than those he brings to himself? And those whom he gives an inheritance to, that we might be sons and daughters of the Most High. And so we see here that Israel's called to take possession. We see them devoting to destruction, bringing that judgment of God upon wicked sinners. Then we see the dividing of the land. As a family, we've been reading through the book of Joshua. uh, And so we've been reading a lot about the dividing of the land. And some days, it's entire verses after verses of these places that we're not exactly familiar with. Not having ever walked around in in, in that region. You can see some of this in, in, in the Bible maps in your, own, in your own Bibles. But the point is, is that there was a land that they would take possession of. 
This is not some sort of spiritual idea that Israel had, but they had an actual possession. They had an actual land. It's one of the reasons why, why I don't spend so much time talking about the glories and hopes of heaven so much as of the new creation. For heaven, it is that intermediate state when, yes, we are united and we are with our Savior. We long for the resurrection. We long to take possession of the promised land, of the glorious new creation. And here we see them beginning to do that here in the Old Testament. Pointing, of course, forward to the reality that one day we will possess a land that cannot be lost. That they took possession. They took possession. And we note that some of them wanted to remain on this side of the Jordan while the rest of them went over to the other side. The two and a half tribes would remain on this western side of the Jordan. And the others would cross over. But Moses gives a very specific instruction to those who would remain. It's there beginning in verse 18 of chapter 3. And I commanded you at that time, saying, The Lord your God has given you this land to possess. All your men of valor shall cross over, armed before your brothers, the people of Israel. Only your wives, your little ones, and your livestock, I know that you have much livestock, shall remain in the cities that I have given you, until the Lord gives rest to your brothers as to you. And they also occupy the land the Lord your God gives them beyond the Jordan. Then each of you may return to his possession, which I have given you. What a glorious reminder of the community that Israel had there in the Old Testament. There they were commanded to help one another, to bring one another into that rest, into that place of their inheritance. They were not simply to look out for themselves, but they were, as Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, to, to consider one another as more highly than themselves. What a glorious reminder for us. There is no retirement in the faith. That is, this side of glory, there is no retirement. You see, this story isn't primarily about a nation conquering a people, but about the battle that the church has been in from, uh, from the very beginning, or at least since the fall, and will continue until the end of this present evil age. And these verses become very helpful reminders to us. For, beloved, we are not yet there. Paul will say that he has not already attained all of this, that is, this perfection that he longs for. Don't you long for a sinless existence? Don't you long to possess that good, promised land, that new creation, where there is no sorrow, there is no suffering, there are no viruses. There's only holiness. There's only joy. There's only good. But we're not there yet. So until we reach that place, until we finally enter and cross that Jordan and our Joshua leads us in, we continue in battle. And just like those two and a half tribes, we are called to care for and even to do battle on behalf of one another. We find this again in the New Testament. We find the language of war being carried on even in the book of Revelation. From Revelation, the dragon is, is, is pictured in chapter 12 becoming furious. And it says that he goes to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Beloved, we are in a battle. We are in a holy war. But the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, as Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians 10, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. The weapons of our warfare are rather the weapons of faith, of love, weapons of our warfare are to be used, yes, in defense of our own faith, but also in care for one another. You see, we will not be, we will not, we will not be fully at rest until each of us crosses over. And so this is the call to us this morning, to remember the good that God has in store for us, to be reminded of the battle that Christ has waged in our behalf as our good King, and to be reminded of the battle that we are involved in each and every day. That spiritual battle that Paul speaks of in Ephesians chapter 10, or sorry, Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. 
Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces in, of evil in the heavenly places. And beloved, this is what is true for us. We are in this battle. And so what is true for us was also what was true for the saints of old. And again, it's this, it's this echo, it's this reminder throughout this chapter or throughout our text. The Lord fights for you. This is how Moses ends this passage. As I, command, I, I commanded Joshua at that time, your eyes have seen all that the Lord your God has done to these two kings. So will the Lord do to all the kingdoms into which you are crossing. You shall not fear them, for it is the Lord who fights for you. Beloved, we are called to fear our God. We are called to serve Him with all that is in us, to honor and to worship and to glorify His holy name, knowing that He fights for us. This is the echo throughout the Scripture. You see, when Israel was pressed up against the Red Sea, and they were afraid that Pharaoh and his army were going to drown them in the sea, Moses reminds them, the Lord will fight for you. You have only to be silent. So here, God reminds the people of Israel through Moses that it is He who will fight for them. And what else do we see in the New Testament than the reality of our Savior coming and fighting for us? He comes and He defeats everything that stands against you. Or sin? Do you think that there is some sin that you will commit that will somehow cut you off from God? There is nothing that will separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That is, if you are trusting in Christ, if you are battling and wrestling with that sin, it is not as though at some point God just says, well, fine, you just can't get it. I'm out of here. The Lord fights for you. You have only to be silent. You have only to believe and to trust in what God has done in Jesus Christ. And as you do, beloved, you have good hope as you wait and long for that glorious day, for that glorious new creation, for that heavenly home. Once more, where there is no sorrow, there is no suffering, there is no sin, there is no enemy. 